Welcome to Lecture 23A, entitled Divergence Theorem in 3D. And this is a tooling example. We just go through a typical example, just sort of un make sure we understand the actual divergence theorem in terms of computation on the left side and the right side. Uh, the material for this lecture comes from reading assignment 4, section 4.1.1. And the objectives are to develop the skills for applying the divergence theorem to geometrical problems. So you're given a shape and we're going to basically apply the uh, divergence theorem. Uh, the concepts, conventions, visualization skills are the closed surface encloses a volume. This is what the divergence theorem basically is stating. And that the surface area vector points outwards from the surface that's enclosing the volume. All right, as usual, the second slide is a summary of the remaining slides, so we'll just move on to the next slide. All right, so here's more or less a summary of what we've done so far and where we're headed. And particularly, I will direct your attention to item five. So in the last lecture, I gave you a summary of the various vector calculus theorems without going into specifics. I just wanted you to get an understanding of the, the geometric meaning of these various theorems and what the various symbols stand for. And then now, basically, we're going to focus on applying, in a simple example using geometry, both Stokes' theorem and Divergence' theorem. And so the focus of the uh, next couple of lectures is the thing that's marked in orange, which is Stokes' theorem and Divergence' theorem. Um, after we have done that, we'll move to reading assignment five, where we look at applying the divergence and Stokes theorem in physical types of problems. And those physical problems would be classical electromagnetic field problems. They could be fluid flow problems. They could be heat transfer problems. There are a range of physical problems in which uh, the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem can be applied. Um, and so the material from which that comes from is... Uh, more or less section 3.5 and 4.6 of reading assignment five. And then towards the end, we'll be just tying up some loose ends. And so those loose ends come from re reading assignment four. We'll show the connection between the divergence theorem and green slux theorem and Stokes theorem and green circulation theorem. The green theorems are effectively 2D analogs of um, the uh, divergence theorem and Stokes theorem in 3D. And then um, we'll also look at, for instance, examples which we haven't considered when applying these two theorems, that's the Stokes and Divergence, and that is you have regions which are a little bit problematic, we'll define that later, and can we still apply the theorems? The answer is yes, but there's certain tricks that you have to perform. And then we'll wrap up the course with uh, some application examples of Green Circulation Theorem and Flux Theorem. All right, so let's start now looking at uh, some examples you applying the divergence theorem. I call them tooling examples, just so you understand the calculation procedure. And there's a little um, demo on the side uh, that you can uh, uh, look at and um, uh, play with it to sort of understand it's, uh, how it can be utilized. And uh, so the problem statement is to compute the left-hand side and right-hand side of the divergence theorem for the pure rotational field. And the rotational of this field in this case is given as shown. Uh, rotational field, we know that um, divergence must be equal to zero. And you're given the surface being two surfaces which have been stitched together. First surface being S1, which is a hemisphere. And the hemisphere basically is given by x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals a squared. Z is greater than or equal to zero. In this example, a equals two. So that's the radius of the hemisphere. And uh, S2 is the base or the disk of radius A in the xy plane. And that's uh, x squared plus y squared less than or equal to A squared. Z equals zero being the xy plane. And again, the, the radius will be A equals two. So we have these two uh, distinct surfaces, uh, which when put together, produce a closed surface. And so what we want to do is to compute closed surface integral of f dot and the SDS. And given that the surface is not a continuous surface, we have to break it up into two separate surfaces. We'll call that the left-hand side. 
there's the integral of the flux, at least the flux calculated over the hemisphere and the flux calculated over the planar disk. And that is equivalent to taking the divergence of the vector field, which is a scalar function, and integrating it over the volume enclosed by the hemisphere and the planar disk. That will be the calculation performed on the right-hand side. So again, D basically just means the volume enclosed by S. This is the way we should look at these things. All right, so let's start by computing the left-hand side, which involves two separate integrals, uh, one involving the circular base and one involving the hemisphere. And so the question then comes down to whether or not we're going to use an explicit representation or par parametric representation of the surface. It'll always be a question of your choice, but if the function is given in explicit form, that is the function of the surface, then we'll use an explicit representation. And so for the circular base, we know z equals zero, so it's far easier to do an explicit representation. And so I've just sort of sketched out the solutions. So z equals g of xy equals zero, and you can compute uh, using explicit representation that n as 2 ds2, which equals tx cross ty dy dx, uh, that basically will just become minus z partial x minus z partial y one, but in this case, z equals zero, so the partials with respect to x and y are both zero. And so we're left with zero, zero, one dy dx. So we always have to now ask ourselves, is that surface here pointing in the right direction? It's got to be pointing outwards from the surface and closing the volume. In this example, no, it's not. And so the simplest way of rectifying the problem is to multiply that surface area, differential surface area vector, by minus one, which is basically what I'm showing in blue. All right, so now we can compute the flux because we've got the value uh, for the, we have the surface, the differential surface area vector. And so F basically now, you have to take the expression for X, dot product with the differential surface area vector, and which is what I've done. And so if you take the dot product of these two, you end up with minus Y. And the region of interest is basically going to be the circle of radius A. And in Cartesian coordinates, the bounds would be the square root of a squared minus x squared would be a half circle, minus the square root of a squared minus x squared would be a lower half circle between upper limits of x of a and my x equals minus a. And so this integral basic can perform and we'll end up with a value of zero. All right, so now let's do the hemispherical surface. We compute the flux from hemispherical surface. In this case, it's easier to work with a parameterized representation. And so you can set this up more or less as a problem in spherical coordinates, but the radius is fixed, the radius A being equal to two. And so you can see here, these are typically the values, the, the uh, functional uh, description that we would expect if we were dealing with spherical coordinates, but A is a constant in this case. Now, because it's a hemisphere, U, it's only going to extend to pi over 2 rather than to pi, whereas v will go the full circle. That's from 0 all the way to 2 pi. So this is a description of the hemispherical surface. Next step would be to compute the t uh, partial u and t partial v. If you do this calculation, you end up with this vector. If you do partial with respect to v, you end up with this vector. And the next step is to take the cross product of these two vectors. And that means you take the determinant of this matrix. Recall, first row are the unit vectors, second row is the first vector, and the third row is the second vector. If you do this calculation, you end up with this result. Now, in this case, the vector is pointing outwards from the hemispherical surface, and therefore, it's in agreement with the convention. So we can make use of that now in terms of computing the, the flux. Again, recall that F has this form. And so now we have to replace y's, x's, and z's with the parameterized values of x, y, and z, which are attained right here. So this is the x value that we use when we make a substitution. So y value we use when we make a substitution. And this is the z value we use making a substitution. And so all of those are then substituted into here to basically form this expression here. And now we just need to take the dot product of this vector with TU cross TV, which is this one that you see here, integrate with respect to DU DV. Well, if you take this dot product, you'll find you'll end up with a value of zero. So no need to integrate because you know the result is going to be to zero anyways.
All right, so now we end up with uh, completing the left-hand side. We've computed this one. We've computed this one. We know this is a zero. This is a zero. Add them together and we get zero. So the total flux from that surf closed surface is zero. All right, we now want to prove that, in fact, the divergence theorem is correct. So let's go ahead and compute the right-hand side of the divergence theorem which means we need to take the divergence of the vector field F and then integrate over the volume that's uh, uh, between the hemisphere and the um, circular uh, disk in the XY plane. All right, so here's the divergence cal calculation. Divergence would be d partial x of the x component, d partial y of the y component, d partial z over the z component. But this term will be zero, this term will be zero, and this term will be zero, so the integrand is zero. I set this integral up just for sake of argument, and so if we're dealing with a hemisphere, that means the z will be from the xy plane to the upper portion of the sphere. That's the hemisphere. Uh, this would be basically the bounds of the circular region. Uh, that's one half circle. This is the lower half circle, but and then the x limits between a and minus a. Well, thank God we didn't have to do this calculation. We could have because in this case it wouldn't have been it wouldn't be necessary since the integrand was zero and so the result is zero hence we conclude left hand and right hand side are in agreement which they ought to be otherwise we would figure that there's something wrong with the divergence theorem or we made a mistake okay so now let's look at an example problem here's the problem statement the vector field has this form and we're interested in finding the outward flux of F across the surface S, which is the surface of the solid bounded by the cylinder X squared plus Y squared equals one, which is this blue region that extends to infinity, but it's cut off by two planes. One at Z equals X plus two, which is up here, and one at Z equals zero, which is the X, Y plane. Now you have two ways of solving the divergence theorem. You can either solve the closed surface integral problem in this case, there are three discrete surfaces, one for the base, one for the outside periphery, and one for this slanted plane. Or you can solve the enclosed volume integral, which means we need the divergence of the vector field, and then we would integrate the, the resultant scalar function over the volume enclosed by these three surfaces. Turns out one of these is usually the easier one of the two, and so the idea here is always to pick the easy one. In fact, the problem will be stated in such a way it will be obvious that one way is the right way to go and the other one is just going to give you nothing but grief. Okay, so you have to make that judgment. All right, so we can do the solution now. So we can easily show that the plane z equals x plus 2 and z equals 0 intersect the cylinder by, defined by x squared plus y squared equals 1. So z equals x plus 2 is the top surface, z equals 0 is the bottom surface of solid. All right, so let v be the region bounded by that surface comprised of three discrete surfaces, then according to the divergence theorem, the total flux basically can be expressed either as a closed surface integral or an integral over a volume, which is bounded by, uh, in this case, the three surfaces. All right, so let's compute the flux using the left-hand side. So we're going to compute this. Here's our value of the vector field. And because there are three discrete surfaces, this closed surface is a superposition or summation of three individual surfaces. This is the cylindrical outer surface. This is the surface z equals zero, and this is the surface at z uh, equals x plus two. The normal vectors for each surface need to be pointing outwards with respect to the closed surface. So that's something you have to keep in mind. So for the top and bottom surfaces, we can use explicit form of surface parameterization. Why? Because we're given z as a function of x and or y, and so that's the simplest thing to do. For z uh, equals x plus 2 surface, if we do the computation, it's minus partial z x minus z partial y at 1 dy dx. And for the z equals 0, it's going to be zx par uh, partial zy partial minus 1. Notice here already I've indicated the, what, which sign will be the correct one. On the upper surface, the vector surface area vector is pointing during the, in the z direction. So that has to be a 1. For the z equals 0 surface, it's pointing downwards with z minus 1. Again, the vector should be pointing outwards from the surface that's bounding the volume or the domain. So these are the correct directions. All right, and so the next step basically is to compute for the top and bottom surfaces 
the contribution of flux for each one of them. And the region basically will be a circle of radius one, which means you've got a half circle and a bottom half circle and X ranging from minus one to positive one. Uh, the, F, the F vector basically, this case we're evaluating at Z equals zero, which means we would go back in here, everywhere we see Z, we plug in zero, which means there's no Y component and no Z component. No Y component, no Z component. Take the dot product with a surface area vector uh, with this expression here. And for the top surface, z equals x plus 2. Same region, there's no difference there. But in this case, if z equals um, x plus 2, and coming back here, this z now becomes x plus 2, and this z here becomes x plus 2. Everything else remains the same. X's and y's don't change. And so there's the contribution of z, there's the contribution of z, and then we have to take this dot, broad, dot product and integrate. Okay, so this is just indicating what I've done here. Uh, so this is basically setting up the integral. All right, I would say that if you can show this type of work when you're doing any form of quiz or exam, that indicates to me you understand the steps. The last step is the actual physical calculation. In some cases, I won't even ask you to do it if it's complicated. Uh, or it's simple enough that you can certainly do the calculation. I would say you would get most of your marks just to getting, for getting to this point. Okay, so let's look at the, the last surface, which is the outer cylinder. In this case, it's better to use surface parameterization. It's easier. So here we have the surface parameterization, cos theta, sine theta, V cos theta plus 2. And V can range from 0 to 1. So this more or less... Uh, allows us just to frame the the outer cylinder and of course it'll have sort of a cut in it and that's indicated here in terms of the z dependency that's why this has a v in here a v cos theta plus two all right okay so for the cylindrical surface then we would just basically compute t theta cross tv dv d theta and so the t theta be, uh, um, cross tv you can go through that computation you'll end up basically with an expression that looks like this. At this point, I, th I leave some of these detailed calculations to you to convince yourself that this is what you end up with. You can also confirm that this vector is pointing outwards from the cylinder surface, which it should be. And now we basically recall from the fact that the vector field has this form. We now basically make the substitutions for x's, y's, and z's. This is the value that substitute for x, this is the value substitute for y, and this is the value that subs gets substituted for z. And so this is really all we're going to be doing, converting f now in terms of functions of theta and of functions of v. And so there it is in full form. So now we take this and substitute here. We have the uh, differential surface for the uh, cylinder, which we computed from here. And we take the dot product and put it together. Okay, so that will be the third flux co contribution. Now, when you look at all of this, you realize there's a lot of work involved. And some of these functions may be complicated. So I'm going to stop there because this is the whole point of this exercise was to show you that at some point you have to make the decision, do I really want to do it? Or do I move on and say, let's see if it's easier to compute the right-hand side, which involves integrating over a volume enclosed by these three surfaces. So that's why we move in that direction. Okay, so right-hand side, this is the uh, divergence of the field, dV integrated over the volume, which basically is enclosed by the three surfaces. So let's do the divergence of f. It'll be just the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, that's the y component, partial with respect to z, the z component. If you take these derivatives, you end up with this expression here. All right, so this is the part now that represents divergence. It gets substituted in. You have dz dy dx. The upper surface, that's the slanted surface, is x plus 2. The lower surface is the xy plane. And this is the region. Okay, this is the projection. So this is a circle of radius 1, upper half circle, lower half circle, and between x of minus 1 to positive 1. All right, so this is a simple integral. But it's easier if we do it in cylindrical coordinates. So that means x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta, and z just remains a z. That means dz dy dx 
replaced by the Jacobian and uh, it, uh, variables used in cylindrical coordinates. And so that's where you see here dz, r, dr, d theta. And this term basically here just becomes r squared, and this becomes r cos theta, and so those two combined give you 4r cubed cos theta, and the r remains here. And so now basically you do the integration first with respect to z, which takes you down, basically gives you a function that looks like this, and then you have a, just a double integral to perform, and this gives you an answer, 2 thirds pi. So it's clear that this was just a couple of lines of calculations, and it was much, much easier to perform than had we uh, done the calculation on the left-hand side. Well, that concludes Lecture 23A. Thank you for listening.